Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, welcome to the confirming workshop. We're really excited to have a bunch of our confirmers here with us today to uh, old confirmers and new confirmers to discuss your your workflows and learn some tips and share some tips and all that good stuff. Um, so just for anyone who's new, um, we'll mostly be talking about IMAP invasives today, <laughs> the centralized invasive species database for New York State. Um, and in New York State, it's administered by the New York Natural Heritage Program, where Jen and I work. Um, so you can learn more about that organization here. Um, and on the slide, I've shown a lot of the things that IMAP has to offer. Um, but since a lot of people here are very familiar with IMAP, I won't go into too much more detail about that stuff, but feel free to go to our website at nyimapinvasives.org to learn more. And to give you an idea of what we'll talk about today, um, about the first half hour of the webinar is going to be, well, really the first like 10, 15 minutes will be some introductory slides and then some live demos from Selma Rosenthal, who's a IMAP confirmer, and Jennifer Dean, our invasive species biologist. Um, and so that'll take up about the first half hour. And then the second half hour is going to be uh, more of a workshop. So we'll have some activities. And the goal is that people will, anyone who has confirming privileges at this point, will have the opportunity to practice confirming a couple of records before the webinar is over. Um, and so I'll start with some introduction. Just gonna make sure everyone's muted. Sorry about that. Okay, so what is confirming and why is it important in IMAP invasives? So the confirmation process is really important to the quality assurance, quality control of the IMAP Invasives database. Um, and there are similar concepts in many other databases as well. Um, so one of the great things about IMAP is that anyone can submit data. So data comes in from our professional partners, uh, species experts, as well as community scientists and volunteers on the ground. So there's this real spectrum of skill sets, um, and there's also a huge range in species. So some species are pretty uh, easy to identify. Some species are super difficult to identify, and it really comes down to very specific parts of their anatomy. Um, so it's really important to have some process in place where uh, records coming in are reviewed and verified. And so records are submitted by IMAP users, and then they are reviewed by the confirmers network. Um, so for example, for Tree of Heaven records, those need to be checked to make sure they're not something like Walnut or Sumac. Um, and then what we have in the end, uh, after these records are reviewed and confirmed is a high quality, a high quality distribution data set. Um, and so, that's very helpful because email alerts are sent to anyone who sets these email alerts up for confirmed records of species and areas they're, they're interested in. Um, the distribution data can influence management priorities. Um, the data in IMAP is used for analyses, including the species tier analysis, which ranks species from widespread to emerging, um, which helps us which helps our manager partners kind of uh, prioritize and select strategies for different species. Um, and observers, like if, if you submit a record of Tree of Heaven, you will get an alert that it has been confirmed. Um, so that's helpful for individual uh, data submitters as well. And just to show you how much data comes in, um, we got over 20,000 records, presence records coming in last year, which is amazing. Um, and we, we do have a lot of confirmers that help us uh, try to keep up with those, but we do always need more help. Um, so we're happy to have about 40 people here today who can help us uh, 
uh, review data and IMAP invasives and keep the database accurate and current. And to talk a little bit about this network of IMAP confirmers and where everyone on the call might fall into it. Um, so we have records submitted by users, they go in as unconfirmed, and then they go through review by this network of IMAP confirmers, and then it comes out as confirmed IMAP data. Um, and so there are a, a bunch, there's a wide variety of people in the network of IMAP confirmers. So kind of the, the, the first block I think of are the high priority or regulated species. These are reviewed by agency staff, mainly at DEC and Ag and Markets um, for regulated and high priority species like spotted lanternfly, Asian longhorn beetle, hemlock blade adelgid, giant hogweed, snakehead, other fish species, hydrilla. Um, so these species are all reviewed by specific staff um, at DC and Ag and Markets. Um, another category of important records are first and county reports, um, which are reviewed by NYNHP staff. Um, and we also coordinate with partners um, to get these records reviewed and followed up on. Um, so first and county reports are like it's the, the first time a certain species was recorded in a certain county, um, which is a really significant record. It might mean either that species was underreported or it's an opportunity for early detection and rapid response. Um, and then a next category of records are uh, it's it's kind of open ended, but it's other key records. Um, so we have a lot of our PRISM partners and other agency staff beyond the specific agency staff uh, reviewing these high priority species. Um, we have this all of these other natural resource professionals helping review species um, reported in locations that are of particular interest to uh, PRISMs, um, agencies, and other partners. Um, and so it's really wonderful to have this network of people reviewing all of this data, um, but it does not cover every single one of those over 20,000 records. Um, so we also rely heavily on volunteer confirmers to help us keep up. Um, and I use the word volunteer, um, but it's not only volunteers, I guess. So some of these volunteer confirmers are volunteer community scientists, um, but there's also natural resource professionals who maybe uh, confirming IMAP data is not part of their job, um, but it's something that they do um, because they have experience um, or they want to help out with the invasive species efforts in the state. Um, so this group includes all those different sorts of people. Um, and by default, we start everyone on our list of 10 common terrestrial plant species just because um, when someone first requests confirming privileges, we might not know what their expertise is. So that's just where we start everyone. Um, but people can move on to species beyond that with our, uh, if they ask us. And many people here are already, already a part of the confirming network. Um, but for anyone who, who is not and is interested, um, these are the steps to join. So you have, to have an IMAP account. We have a PDF um, that kind of goes through the confirming process, and I'll send that out at the end of the webinar. Um, and there's a form on there for you to fill out to request confirming privileges if you're interested. And then once you fill out that form, we reach out to ask you to confirm a couple records, which we then double check. And once everything's all sorted out and uh, we're, we're confident that that uh, you understand the, the confirming process and everything, um, and we don't have to go over any more details, then you are on your way and you're a, an IMAP confirmer. Um, and we'll really appreciate any help you give us to uh, review data. And before the live demos, just to kind of frame the general process and how confirming works and what to look for. Um, so when you're confirming, you'll be looking at 
when you're confirming IMAP records, you'll be looking at individual presence record pages for unconfirmed records. That's why it's a pink dot on this map. Um, so a couple things to check are one thing to do a quick check of is just does the location make sense? Um, and this is really just a very basic quick check, like for Oriental Bittersweet. Um, I want to see that it's on land, that it's not in the middle of a lake or something. So um, you're not expected to think too deeply about the location. You don't have to go out to that location and ground truth it or anything. It's just to make sure it makes sense on a very basic level. Um, and then the next big thing to look at is that the photo here matches the species listed. And you can click on the photo, the little thumbnail here to blow up a full uh, full sized version of the picture and zoom in and look at the details and everything. Um, and one thing I want to note here is that you do see you will see two pictures in many cases. Um, so please remember that this picture on the right is a general reference photo, as it says in the label. Um, so this is not the photo that the observer took. Um, this is a, a photo that we have selected as the reference photo. So you can compare the photos, um, but you should not be looking at this photo and deciding whether it's the species or not, um, because it definitely is the species. This is just for your reference. So make sure you're reviewing the observer's photo. Um, and there's a couple of different scenarios that you'll run into. Um, so hopefully, um, the species is correct, or I guess sometimes you might hope it's incorrect if it's a species that you're hoping is not in the area yet. Um, but a lot of the times the species is indeed, uh, the species in the photo is indeed matching the species that was reported. Um, so in those cases, you confirm the record. Um, in some cases, you might find that the species is incorrect, like maybe someone submitted a photo of sumac, but it was listed as tree of heaven. Um, so if sumac is a native species. We don't need that in our database. We don't track that species. And so um, you would contact us to get that record deleted. In other cases, the species might be incorrect, but it's just a different invasive. Um, so maybe someone reports a Japanese barberry, but looking from the picture, it's actually a European barberry um, or common barberry. Um, then you can change the species to the correct species and then confirm it. Um, and you'll also run into situations where maybe the photo is blurry, you can't tell the species, maybe it's not the right time of the season, you, you don't see a flower in the photo or something that would allow you to identify it. Um, so in that case, we do have this option to mark a record as insufficient to confirm. Um, and this will make more sense later, um, but I do want to just put this note in that you do not press the confirm button when you want to flag these insufficient records. Um, and just a tip, um, we recommend that confirmers keep a, some sort of note page or something to keep a log of any problem records they come across so that you have a list um, that you can send to us um, if you're like a, if you're someone who confirms frequently, if you, if you just have one record every once in a while that needs to be fixed, you can feel free to just send those as they come. But this is just a, a recommendation for, um, if you do a lot of confirming and you don't want to send us an email, um, all the time, whenever you find a problem record, because you come across them frequently, this is just an option to, uh, sort of keep your thoughts organized and remember. Uh, and remember any issues uh, that you think need to be addressed. And I mentioned the confirming versus insufficient to confirm. Um, so when, when the record looks good, there's this confirm button on the record page. Um, it'll only appear if you have confirming privileges, which you'll need to request if you don't have them. Um, and so you click the confirm button and fill out the, the pop-up box. Um, if it's not, if you can't confirm it, um, so if you want to mark it as insufficient, you don't press the confirm button, you press the edit button at the top. 
And then you scroll down and you uh, fill out the confirmation fields. Oh, and that's actually the, I picked the wrong one in this screenshot. It should actually be um, insufficient to confirm. Um, and then you save. And so we have a couple of rules that we've come up with for confirming. Um, one of them is to not confirm your own records. This is just kind of best database practices. Um, it, it's always better if there's a second pair of eyes um, to confirm the records. So you should only be confirming records submitted by other observers. Um, we also ask you to only confirm species you've been approved to confirm and that you will feel confident confirming. Um, so an example of that is like um, I mentioned those species that have a DEC reviewer like giant hogweed and hydrilla. Those are off limits for like general confirmers um, beyond those specific people who confirm those records. Um, and if you're like a volunteer and we've started you out on the 10 common species, uh, make sure you get uh, some approval of from us on confirming other species before you start confirming other species, just so we make sure we have a handle on who's confirming what in IMAP. Um, we also ask people to fill out the concert, the confirmation method and verified by fields um, and to confirm records that you are, are reasonably certain are correct um, if you're not sure, you should be using the insufficient to confirm option. Um, and just to show you what the confirmation methods are, the main one to use will be the photo ID. Um, so that means you looked at the photo and verified the species, but there are other options, which I won't go into detail now, but they are in the handouts that we have that I'll send out after today. Um, and the confirmation is where you flag where you tag a record as insufficient data to confirm as well. Um, but one important distinction is when it's a correct record, you you select the confirmation method in that pop-up box when you press confirm. If it's potentially not correct, you you tag the record as insufficient to confirm by pressing edit and then editing the confirmation method. Um, and so there's a lot of different strategies to go about confirming. Um, so you use the map interface, you can set up email alerts, um, you can use the filter tool, the ID measure tool, all sorts of things can be helpful in collecting records and going through them. Um, there's, there's many ways to do it, people do it differently. And so in this next part of the webinar, we'll have some live demos um, and first, it's going to be uh, Selma, who is going to go through her work workflow for confirming records. And it'll take a second to switch over the screen share to her, um, but I'll do that. And then I'll also answer some questions in the chat box. Yeah, Mitch, I've been watching the questions come through. So there are a few general questions, so this might be a good time to um jump into those you want me to read them for you and then sure the answer all right do you need confirming privileges for every record or do you get blanket privileges for confirming um so you get uh the the confirming privileges are doled out based on taxa generally like uh uh like terrestrial plants for instance you can get privilege to confirm those um, and then we just generally ask you to stick to a certain list of species, like for, like most people are not supposed to be confirming those. Yeah, exactly. Unless it's a special species, you can confirm it. Great. And Steve's wondering if, if you have a project that the records need to be confirmed ASAP, can you make some kind of request that those records get reviewed? I. Yeah, for that kind of stuff, you can email us at imapinvasives at dec.my.gov. Great. And then I see one from Jason, um, and I can probably answer this one. If I'm entering a record based on a public report, a non-IMAP report, um, and this is through uh, lands and forests, 
Would you still consider it confirming my own record if I confirm it? And Jason, you are special. And there might be a few other special cases out there that, um, yes, you can certainly go ahead and um, confirm those records once you enter it as a, a public record. Um, so that's that's a good question. Well, um, it won't count as confirming your own record that you observed and entered. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Selma, is your screen share working yet? It is. Thank you. Okay, cool. Thanks so much. Well, Hello. actually, we have a couple more that I'm sorry. A That's okay. Go ahead. That have come in. Just a second, Selma. Um, so Megan's saying, so I can confirm any record as long as it isn't a special species like Hydrilla. Oh, and yeah, for yeah, in, in general, the answer is yes, um, with the exception of like if how we start people out with that list of like the common 10 species. So that's where we start you out. Um, but then if you talk to us and you have taxonomic expertise and we can verify that and everything, and then you're, we say you can confirm other species, then it's um, any species that you're comfortable with apart from those special uh, highly regulated or high priority species. And then one more from Naya, um, will data submitters get an email if their report is determined not to be correct? That's a good question. Jen, correct me if I'm wrong. I think they will get a, a, a an alert if their record has been edited or deleted, which is usually one of those things would happen, like if it was marked as insufficient to confirm or if it was deleted, if it was wrong. Is that right? You know, actually, we should test that on the deleted records, and I am going to show that in the email alert section that you can sign up to get alerted at any time one of your records is modified. Um, and so that's a great question. I, I don't know confidently whether or not that triggers on deleted records, but that would be a great functionality to have, I think. Um, one thing, you know, with, we would love to contact every user individually when, um, something is incorrect. And, you know, when we first started IMAP, like 12 years ago now, we were able to do that because everything was coming in very slowly and we could do a personal email to everyone and describe what the difference is between their identification and the actual species. But realistically, it's, it's very challenging to do that now because there's so many records, like Mitch said, like 21,000 records coming in. I mean, not all those are incorrect, but we, you know, we probably have a good 500 to 1,000 records that are incorrect each year. For high priority species, we do reach out you know, and let the, the folks know, you know, especially if it's something that we want to hone their identification skills for a certain early detection species. Um, but we don't it individually reach out to each of those, but we will check on that um, automatic alert system and see if that does include deleted species. All right, I think that's all the questions. So Selma, you can turn it over to Selma now. Sorry about that. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Selma Rosenthal. Um, yeah, so when I go to confirm a species, I live in the Syracuse area, so I go to the Syracuse area. Um, I have a couple of species that I personally am kind of curious about, one of which is pale swallowwort, because we have a lot of pale swallowwort in the area, but we don't yet have black swallowwort. So I will probably often go and look for pale swallowwort. So I Type in pale swallowwort. Um, and then it's really helpful, obviously, to have a photo. So I click, I only want to look at entries that have a photo. Um, and then I also need to make sure that I'm looking at um, unconfirmed, because I don't want to see all the confirmed ones. And there's certainly a number in the area. Um, so I will generally, I have to make sure to remember not to click on one that I've done. Um, so I might go a little further afield, but I'll click on a circle. Um, I will, sorry about that, I keep moving this. Um, look at the photo. Um, and I generally look at the date in July. Um, kind of look at the general location, and then I'll click on the photo, 
and I'll notice it does have these pink sort of magenta leaves. It does not have the really dark purple black leaves that are more characteristic of black swallowwort. So I will then, um, oops, sorry, go back and, and then we'll technical difficulty, uh, go back to the present slide. Um, so I'm comfortable confirming this, but I will, so I'll go to confirm. Um, let's see, there are a couple places I might, Uh, write a few comments. I will write that the flowers are pink, um, magenta, uh, just to make people aware that I have looked at that and I've thought about the pale swallow, uh, the black swallower. Um, I've used a photo to identify it. And then I type in my name. And then I hit continue. And then I always also check uh, just to make sure if I go back to the map. Um, that that dot there should turn to green in a few minutes. Or it should well, it's disappeared. So I know that it has uh, been confirmed. Um, so that's pretty much it. I often will also do Phragmites. So if I want to change, I will clear the filter and try a different species. Ah. So I will go and try Phragmites. That's a common one. Sorry. And I think I forgot to hit photo only, so we're going to get all of them. Let's see if I can get. Um, so I can uh, choose some of these. And then again, I'll just check. Um, there's a whole strip here. I'll check the date, April. Um, I'll click on the picture and I will just check to make sure that there's a date on here. And this says July 2019 and the picture said April. So I may just in this case, um, I'll come back to it. I, I don't know if I, I could either confirm it and say the date is off by a few months or um, it, clearly if it was winter, I, I would say insufficient data to confirm where the date doesn't match. Um, but yeah, so that's, uh, I guess that's about it. I tend to not do the option to grab all the um, unconfirmed species in an area, I tend to just click on the pink dots and yeah, I guess that's, that's about it. Thanks, Selma. Um, I was wondering, Jen, should you or I, do you want to comment on these, uh, Fragmites Google imagery records that we sometimes oh. see? Yeah, that's a great. Um, thing to point out because um, I can talk about that. There's a um, volunteer, a kind of a self appointed volunteer that created a project for herself driving the roads of New York State with Google Street View imagery. Because as we all know, Google Street View imagery is scary good. Um, and actually, she's been looking for common species that are detectable along the roadways. So you'll see a lot of Phragmites and knotweed images. And so um, she we have worked with her to include a snippet of the map from Google Maps and include the date, the imagery date that Google provides so that um, she can backdate those to when the image was actually taken. Um, so you will see these and they are up for grabs for confirming for sure. Um, because, you know, if the photo looks good and if you can tell from the photo, she did do quite a few tree of heaven. Um, records at one point, or she might still be doing those, um, especially when 
you know, we were doing a big push to get more tree of heaven with a spotted lanternfly coming into the state. And many of those are difficult to tell from the Google Street View imagery. Um, you know, there's certain characteristics, like, you know, if it's when it's in fruit, um, it is easier to distinguish, but sometimes the images are just too blurry because of the way that Google Street View imagery is taking the photo. Um, so you can certainly mark those as insufficient data to confirm if you cannot tell, you know, confidently from the photo there. Awesome, thank you. Thanks for clarifying that, Jen, and thank you, Salma, for sharing your workflow and for all the confirming that you do in general. Oh, you're welcome. And so I just switched the um, the the presentation privilege to Jen, so you should be able to share your um, account for your live demo. So next, we'll hear from Jen about some some other things that you uh, other tools you can use in your confirming. Great, thanks a lot. And Selma actually gave us a sneak peek of some of those um, that I'll be showing, and um, hopefully there's a uh, a tip that you'll be able to get some of from our new features that are here that will help um, some of the one of the issues that you mentioned. So we have some new things coming out. Um, first, I want to show you the email alert system. So whenever you are logged in, you can go to the little icon in the upper uh, left hand corner and your email alert. And so if you click on that, you have the email alert page that's open. If you have email alerts set up, then you'll be able to scroll through those. Um, if you don't have any set up yet, then it'll be blank. Um, and you can, um, in the upper right hand corner, there's add edit alerts. So you want to click that. Sorry, I might have done that too quickly. This little area up here, you can um, click that to enable the edit mode for your email alerts. The first thing I'll point out are there are some check boxes for some general alerts. Um, and one of those, the very first one is alert me when a record I created has been updated. And so um, this is what we, Mitch and I were um, talking about earlier. Um, so if you click this, then anytime somebody confirms one of your records or changes the species, um, you'll get an email alert saying that your record has been updated. Um, and we don't, we can't, we don't know yet if that also applies to deleted records. Um, we will check the, the functionality on that and see what the programmers had put in there. Um, it does make sense. Unfortunately, once something is deleted, then you can no longer see that record. So that would be a little um, problematic, but if it, it could at least notify you that your record has been deleted, then I think that would be very helpful. All right. And so um, I have some alerts already set up, but I'm going to go through the process of adding a new alert. So I push that little plus button and I get this blank screen that pops up um, with our um, with our alerts. And so I'm going to set up um, an alert that say goes on, let's say the Finger Lakes Prism unconfirmed records. And you can you want to make a an alert name that's useful for you because this will be um, part of the email subject line when this email alert comes to you. Um, so just keep that in mind when you create the alert name. If you just say IMAP alert and you have like 10 alerts, it's not going to be as helpful. Um, you know, you want to distinguish those. Um, frequency, you can either do it immediately. I, I don't recommend that if you have a big alert. I would recommend either a daily or a weekly alert. Um, I like to get daily digest, you know, so it will give me like the list of all those species from the previous day. So let's say I want to do this at 8 a.m. each morning. Um, so you can fill in the time that your daily digest will arrive. And then this next part, this criteria, this is new, well, new as in the last few months, um, but it's really important for confirmers. Um, it defaults to this checkbox that says alert on new or modified confirmed records. But as a confirmer, um, you actually get another option. So I'm going to uncheck that. And it's, I'm going to check the first one that says alert on new or modified unconfirmed records, because as a confirmer, that's what you want to see, right? You want to see the unconfirmed records. Um, and so you could do both of them if you wanted to, but as a confirmer, I like to keep them separate. Um, so I want my unconfirmed records in a separate email to just kind of keep things clean. Um, and then there's lots of different ways you can set up the email alert. You can set it up by species type. Um, you can select one specific species if you want to and so forth. 
I'm just going to leave it as any species. And I want to do it from a for a prism. Um, so if I click geography type, um, then I can see that these different options emerge for geography type. And the prisms are listed as regional management partnerships. Uh, makes sense. And so when I select that, I need to now select, okay, which state am I looking for a prism in or a partnership in? So I want to click New York. And then I get the list of any um, uh, prisms that touch into New York. And there's actually a couple of prisms from Pennsylvania that um, that kind of bleed into New York. And so those are, um, you'll also see those, but I'll select Finger Lakes. You could add a buffer if you wanted to like 10 miles or something, but I'm just gonna leave it as, I want a, um, a daily digest of all the unconfirmed records entered into the Finger Lakes prisms um, prism each day. And so I scroll up and I hit save. And so now I can see that this is saved as one of my, one of my um, alerts that happen each day. And it, you'll only get an alert if um, data is actually entered that match that criteria. Um, so if nobody entered records that day in the Finger Lakes, then you won't see an alert that day for the next day. All right. And so now kind of on to the more exciting stuff. Well, I mean, email alerts are exciting, don't get me wrong. Um, but we have some really cool things that have come out recently um, with the filter. And you can see data people get excited about, <laughs> about it. Um, things like data filters and so forth. Um, all right, so when I log in, you know, and I zoom into New York to see the, the New York data, um, and we have all these action tools across the upper um, right-hand corner, and I'm gonna hit filtered records, because this is where all my power is, really. Um, when it first opens up, it will be in this general tab, and if you haven't logged into IMAP and used the filter in a while, You'll notice this is new, like there are now tabs that um, for the filter, it used to be just one um, filter page. And so um, one thing that is new is that the species list, the drop down list now defaults to your state. So if you have New York selected as your home jurisdiction, um, those that's the species list that will default when you're looking for a species. So if we do, we want to do Emerald Ashboard. So this, you know, it, it's different between the network list or the New York list because there's many more species across the whole nation. Um, so you'll get a list of about like 4,000 species, whereas in the New York list, you only have about 400 species. So if I apply my filter, so I select a species, you can select other things like uh, species type, habitat, projects, organizations, and so forth. Um, but this is the standard, um, you know, searching that we've had for a while. So you can search by species. Um, but now what I want to do is go back to that filter records and I want to look at some of these other tabs. Um, I will come back to the presence tab because that's where confirming will, will happen. But I'll just point out that, um, if you do have permission to enter treatments, you'll see a treatment tab there and then not detected as well. Um, everyone who has an IMAP account has not detected. And then I'm going to come back to the records ID tab here in a little bit. All right, but for the presence tab, we have a lot of new um, options in here and Selmo has discovered these, which is great. Um, so we have say confirmation method. So if I wanna look at confirmed records that were confirmed by photo ID, I can select that and hit apply filter. And I'm gonna close this filter box so I can see it. Um, and so these are the, the EAB record or the Emerald Ash Borer records that have been confirmed by a photo. Um, I can go back to my filter records tool. Here, I'm trying to nudge the map over a little bit so you can see some of the, the changes. So maybe I wanna add on to that. Um, I've already picked on Jason Denham once, so <laughs> I'm gonna pick on you again. Um, we'll say, you know, species verified by Jason. And so that down. Um, so here are the Emerald Ash Borer records that have been verified by Jason by a photo. Um, so it gives you a lot of, um, you know, handy ways to sort through the, the, the data. Um, you can, and it's also that verified by is helpful for you because if you're doing say an annual report and you wanna list out how many records you confirmed last year, you know, you can set the record. Um, this is the record, the date that a record is observed. 
Um, and then you can say, um, put your name there and you can get um, all the records. You can actually create a report then on the export report tool um, of all those records that you've confirmed. All right, there are a couple other fields that are not necessarily related to confirming. We have this follow up tab. These are fields that are within the presence record itself. I feel like they don't get populated very much, but now that it's in the actual filter and filterable, um, people might start populating this more in terms of like, you know, management candidate, rapid response candidate, and so forth, and evaluation type as well, like monitoring post treatment versus a casual or incidental finding. But like I said, not as um, necessary for confirming. Um, another thing that people have been waiting for is, um, you know, has a photo. And Selma did use that. And this is really helpful because it's really hard to confirm a record that does not have a photo on it. Um, so, you know, if I um, I'll go ahead and apply the filter here. So these are the records that I guess Jason has identified and have a photo. Um, let's see, and I can, I can toggle those as well to, um, say, well, you know what? I'm realizing I, you can trip yourself up if you have too many filters on, and then you're, you know, it's going to limit the, the records that are there. So right now I just have all the confirmed records because I have confirmed turned on that have a photo of Emerald Ash Borer. Um, but, you know, as a confirmer. I'm interested, right, in the unconfirmed present species. So these are, oops, these pink dots now are the unconfirmed records that have a photo. Um, you know, I could still toggle on the, the confirmed records. Sometimes these hexagons are kind of helpful because you could see where there's an unconfirmed one that's like an anomaly, like sticking out somewhere. Um, but there's more nuance that you can get from this, this filter record tool as well. Um, you can, um, for that confirmation method, you can see, okay, which ones have already been reviewed but deemed insufficient data to confirm. So I'm gonna look at the map there. And so you can see one of those little outliers has already been reviewed. It's determined that we can't, um, we can't confirm it from that photo or, you know, either they didn't enter a photo or, um, um, or the photo was too blurry or did not show all the right things that it needs needs to show to confirm that record. Um, so that's one way you can look at it, but so now you can do kind of like the flip of that. I want to exclude all the records that have already been reviewed and deemed insufficient data to confirm, and I only wanna focus on records that have a photo that have not been re reviewed yet. And so at the very bottom of this pick list is not listed. So that's essentially null or nothing has been entered for this confirmation field. And so if I click that, then um, those records that were insufficient data to confirm disappeared. And so now this is a map of records that have a photo that presumably have not been reviewed because they do not have anything in that confirmation method. Um, so that would, you know, that helps um, eliminate some. I know you you said you were kind of run, kept running into records you've already reviewed and marked as insufficient data. So this is how you can exclude them by using that not listed function on the um, the confirmation method. Another cool trick, if you're doing a lot of confirming with the same filter settings, is that you can actually grab the URL and um, save that somewhere. Like you you can open up a text doc or a Word doc. Um, it's kind of, it's a really long URL, but essentially like every time that, like if you look at like the, um, the coordinates on that URL there, every time I move the map, the URL actually updates. And so the URL captures the, the centering of the map, all the filter settings, whatever layers you had on and off. And so that's a really um, handy trick to have, say if you wanna go in there each week and you wanna confirm just, you know, the settings for that one filter, you can do that. Um, keep in mind that if you are saving a URL that includes unconfirmed records, you need to be um, logged into the system. Um, you can click on that URL, even if you're not logged in, um, but the public map only shows confirmed records. And so you have to log in first and then apply your saved URL in order to see the unconfirmed records. All right, so 
back to our filter, you might notice that these little green dots have appeared on the tabs, like the general and the presence tab. And that means that there is a filter active, you know, so if I'm going in, you know, cause like I said, I can kind of, I'll easily do this. I'll, um, you know, trip my own self up because I've, I've put in too many filters and I've forgotten that I've, you know, kind of counter counteracted what I'm trying to look for and, and nothing shows up. And it's so, usually because there's um, other filters on in place already. Um, so you can do, there's a button on all the tabs to clear the filters. And so that takes away that green dot from everywhere. Um, and now I wanna show you this last tab here, this record IDs tab. Um, so if I click on that, this is handy. It, you could list a long string of record IDs um, in each of these for presence, not detected treatments and searched areas. And when this comes in handy, is when you have um, an email alert here. So I'm gonna bring up my email alert that I got this morning. Um, so this is all unconfirmed records from New York. Um, you know, I get this record in the morning, this alert in the morning. There were um, seven unconfirmed records that were entered yesterday. And so I got this at like, what, eight o'clock or seven o'clock in the morning. Um, but you can see like each, um, this is what the Daily Digest looks like. Um, you have the record ID for each of these. So I found that it helps for me, at least in my email client, if I start at the bottom one, but I can actually highlight those record IDs. And so I just have the numbers rec um, highlighted. I can hit copy and then I go back over to IMAP and I go into that presence records ID box and I paste them in there and then look, it converts it into a comma separated text string. Um, like I said, data people get really excited about these things. Um, I apply the filter and look, now it's just showing me those records that were from my email alert this morning. I can go to this identify measure tool, um, you know, make a little polygon around those records that I'm seeing and hit see what's here. And look at that. I have, um, you know, well, I only have three of my records for my email alert, but, um, it's showing those here. I'm gonna show you why. If I turn on the confirmed records, um, this email alert was sent at 7 a.m. this morning, but since then, some of our confirmers have been very busy and have already confirmed um, four of those records from my alert. <laughs> and so the confirmers are, are very quick sometimes. Um, one thing that's helpful, I know that um, it's been, um, it's kind of tricky to get information when you're zoomed out and you see those orange hexagons to actually get information about those hexagons. It just says, you know, hexagon ID, it's not very useful for you. Um, but one little trick is if you um, have that identify measure tool already activated and you just zoom in anywhere in the map so that it gets to the point where those orange generalized hexagons turn into the actual um, confirmed green points and then put see what's here, then it will show you, I guess I didn't have all of them captured, but it, then it will show you the um, confirmed presences as their useful individual record line. And so these were from my email alert this morning. Um, and so I can click on that record details to actually see the presence record, um, let that load up for a second. And so this is something that um, someone submitted Yesterday, it has HWA on it. And if I scroll down to the confirmation fields, um, you can see that Carrie Marshner has already been at it this morning. She's very quick. Um, she's from the Hemlock Initiative. And so she confirms a lot of the HWA. Sometimes she beats out Jason <laughs> in the confirming. They have a race going on. Um, but you can see that she's already confirmed that record. So that's why there sometimes might be a mismatch from the time that you receive that email the time you go to open the record, it might already be confirmed. All right, so that's all I had for the um, confirming demo. Um, we can take any questions that folks might have. Awesome. Thank you, Jen. Um, there is one, there was a really interesting question in the chat from Dan Drake, um, and I tried to respond. Um, can you 
review that and see what your thoughts are. Oh, okay. Um, are you, do you have it open? Can you let's see? Oh, are sure. Um, read it. Yeah, I said. Um, how about confirming something that someone else has deemed as insufficient to confirm? For example, if someone submitted a record near near you, um, and it was easy to go check that species. Um, with, could they confirm that record if they go back into IMAP? Um, and the other option would be to instead submit a new record with a better picture of the species that could be confirmed. Ah, yeah, that's great. Um, that's a great question. So a couple of things there, like um, here, maybe I'll I'll click on oops, move the map. I'll click on one of these unconfirmed records so we can actually see the record page um, while we talk about it. But yeah, if it's something that you open up the photo and say you have some taxonomic expertise on that species and you're able to tell that, yes, that definitely um, is that species, then you can override the insufficient data to confirm as long as that record is still unconfirmed, which it should be. Um, and I always just recommend that people will then um, put in the confirmation comments, you know, so indicate what has happened, you know, say, you know, this record was originally marked insufficient data to confirm. Um, but with these characteristics, I was able to confirm it. Um, so that's one way to do it. Like, if you are able to tell from that photo itself, um, you can certainly do that. Um, the other case of you've actually gone out to that spot and you've confirmed it on the ground yourself. Um, I do like to encourage people to go ahead and make a new observation. Um, you know, because now you can enter a new um, photo, which will be very helpful. Um, and, you know, it's super easy with the IMAP mobile app. You can just take a photo and uh, grab your coordinates and then upload it to the database. And it should be right at the same spot. You could still, you know, additionally, like go in and you could, um, you could um, go ahead and confirm this one, you know, like the one that's already in there with a, you know, kind of blurry photo or something. And you can put multiples. You can say, you know, maybe the, Blurry photo got you to at least like the genus, um, but you actually checked it out on the ground and you saw it was there, then, um, you know, you could mark that as well as locally common because you saw a lot of it there. And then once again, I would fill in the confirmation comments to, to um, really document that. All right, are there any other questions? Yeah, happen? there's a, a couple. Um, yeah. And so I, I will say we are like starting to get to two o'clock. So some people might have to leave before we get to some of the workshop activities, but um, that is still coming up and I'll stay on beyond two um, so that we can still do those workshop activities. But for now, since there's good questions, I think we should just go through yeah. those. Um, Sounds good. So one. Uh, so Ryan asked, are the prism tiers in IMAP? It would be nice to be able to filter on or send emails for unconfirmed tier twos. Um, yes, we've gotten that question before. Um, unfortunately, the tiers are not in IMAP um, because IMAPs uh, is used in not just New York and the tiers change every couple of years. Um, but there are a couple of tips that I often tell people. So for, for filtering, um, it will always be a pain. Like there's no way to get around it. You will have to put in all of those species. Um, but you can use that URL saving trick. Like you can create a bookmark. So you can, like you could go through typing in, putting in all of those species one time and then bookmark it, and then you'll have it whenever you want, and you won't have to go through that filter again. Um, kind of same thing with the email alerts. Um, you will have to do the, the tedious work to set up the email alert, but once it's set up, you're all good, and it will keep working. Um, and I saw Haley had a idea, um, copy-pasting them from a spreadsheet. Yeah, I haven't tried that. That's a good idea. I think you probably have to do it one at a time. I don't think you can paste in like a comma separated list. Oh, that's a but good type, question. I think you, that could help type uh, like copy and pasting one species at a time would be faster than typing out and selecting. So that's a good idea. 
Um, and then Steve had a good question. That's a good question for Jen, I think. Um, in Lower Hudson, there are some records where numerous records have been submitted of a common species, but without photos as a part of one of their block, excuse me, blockbuster projects. Um, should people deal with these? Ah, um, and that's actually, if we have someone for Lower Hudson, you can chime in on this too, if I'm getting it wrong. But over the years, we have worked with um, um, Linda um, when she was leader at the Lower Hudson Prism to bulk upload the data from their volunteers for their big trail blockbuster um, survey project that they had going on. And um, there were a number of the record, and they didn't require photos at the time that they um, did this big project. And it did result in thousands and thousands of records that are now listed as unconfirmed in IMAP. Um, and she was able to identify some of the volunteers that she considered experts. And so those records got confirmed. But on the other, um, many of the, the records we had to leave as unconfirmed. And so um, I think that's a good question. Like, you know, we, we kind of left it with her that we would leave them as unconfirmed unless Lower Hudson said otherwise. Um, but maybe what Steve's mentioning, like this locally common, like if they are common species and they are surrounded by other um, observations, confirmed observations of that same species, that might be a good criteria um, for which somebody could go in and confirm those. I would just want to double check with the Lower Hudson Prism staff um, first before we, you know, kind of made a, a movement on that. Um, you know, as of right now, we're leaving them as un unconfirmed, but I do like that idea of like many of those probably could be confirmed as common species, which I think, you know, when you select the like, um, you know, when you have that confirmation method, there's the photo ID and then there's the locally common. Um, and I, in my mind, like the locally common kind of carries less confidence weight, I guess, in terms of like how confident you are in the species, because obviously you didn't see a photo. Um, but the benefit of being able to tease that out is it does allow us to confirm more records that, yes, you know, Phragmites is in a lot of spots um, and it's, you know, already confirmed in this area. So we can say pretty confidently that it's Phrag. Um, you know, we can tease that out in the data itself, which is nice, you know, so if you don't want to see things that, or say you only want to see things that were confirmed via the photo ID, because that's the highest level of confidence, perhaps, um, now you can do that. You can tease that out with the, the filter. Hi, Jennifer. It's Brent Boscarino from Lower Hudson Prism. Um, I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to work with you on some of these answers since I've been into, intimately involved with the Invasive Strike Force surveying reporting and give you some updates on Blockbuster. I'm not going to do that in this big call here, but um, I'm happy to work that out and make a best best plan for moving forward and what you want to do with those. So I think we're on hold awesome. for that for now. Um, I'm coming to see you guys in a couple of weeks, so we can talk about it then. That's great. Thank you so much, Brent. Yeah, yeah we'll no worries. Happy to help. Uh, keep keep everyone posted as that come as we figure things out. I will. Yep. Great. All right. Other questions? Awesome. Um, I there was another question, but I think you pretty much answered it talking about okay. those that locally common option. Um, so I'll steal the presentation back for a second. Perfect. Um, and so wrong slide. Oh, we have some like workshop activities to do, but since it's two, I'll also do like a quick wrap up and then anyone who can stay on beyond two and is interested in participating in the workshop, then we can do those for a couple minutes after. Um, so just some quick take home messages, uh, maintaining a current high quality database, invasive species database uh, requires a network of data reviewers. Um, so we thank everyone who's interested in being part of that. Um, and you can help by being an IMAP confirmer. Um, we start people out uh, by default. We generally start people out on the 10 common invasive plants, but there is there are opportunities to go beyond that if you have the identification skills and the interest. Um, and there are a bunch of tips you can utilize, so the a bunch of tools and functionalities, the filter tool, email alerts, uh, the identify measure tool, and more. 
Um, and you can join us again next month for our next webinar, which will be about the field data collection tools. It should help people uh, identify which tools are best for certain projects. Um, and we have some map and mapping, excuse me, mapping initiatives coming up as well. So NHWA mapping challenge and the SLF grid square effort from last year is returning for this year as well. Um, and I just saw a good question, so I'll answer that before launching into the workshop. Um, but anyone who has to leave, thank you for joining. Um, but we'll we'll stay on to do the workshop.